Well, again, this is on behalf of 1882 and all the partners, we want to thank you for spending your, your day with us. And um, it's going to go into the, the other programs that are going on in the next couple days. I just wanted to point out this um, very or orbital looking piece of paper. And it's only because Ali is so in incredibly creative, I believe, that we have an oval paper. So you can write on it whatever you want. You don't have to put your name on it, but if you want to put your name on it, that's I think out of this whole session, which is a bit, a lot of information, somewhat exhaustive, if you wouldn't mind putting one, two, or three points on it that you think are important to carry forward. And this will be like your vote. <laughs> Having heard all these things today, what are the things that personally strike you? Um, if you are really good at writing, you can use the back. <laughs> so, um, but if you just want to jot down even one thing that you feel is like, Huh? Thing. No, no, go for it. I really like it. And I think Allie is probably going to, Allie going to raise her hand. So she is going to collect them somewhere near the door. Um, she'll either walk around or if you don't know where to just say, hey, yeah. Allie, I have one. So that's, that's the homework. Um, there's no more panel discussion. And I think the focus of this is just so that the conversations that we just interrupted, we can actually continue with them. Um, also, if we have any of the uh, speakers or partners who have additional information that they were able to give out or add anything, is there anyone who had any information they wanted to hand out? No, sir, this is, I, we have a, a pamphlet that NDC used for our annual lobby day. I don't have a lot of them, but we can give folks an idea about um, programs and priorities for national parks. Um, I don't think my park service partners are allowed to even look at this, so I'll keep it away from them for a bit. But, um, this is an advocacy, advocacy document, but you're welcome to take those. And I have a handful of uh, uh, maps of the national park system, so people can take those. And I can get more if you if, if people need them. Thank you, Alan. Any, any other partners that have anything they'd like to? There's a hand up the back. I just uh, can you wait for the I'm just an interested party here. Um, my uh, great grandfather worked on the railroad, so that's why I'm here. But I have an interesting anecdote, short one. Um, my husband and I were in Iceland um, last May, almost a year, and we were went to the different tourist sites. And one of the waterfall sites that we went to was filled with Asian tourists. And when we were walking around, you know, I said, Joe, these people are speaking Cantonese. <laughs> They're just, you know, not just Asian tourists. So I'm thinking, thinking big picture, I know there's a lot of money in China, and, you know, there's a lot of uh, interest in travel. So that, that might be something that you could think about in the future, you know, and, you know, getting better relations with, with China itself, you know, the combined history of both countries. So. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's actually, that's, a big comment that many people are looking at in terms of what is the largest international tourist market. Are there any other comments? Uh, chance on talk about today, and we still have all the session tomorrow. Final sort of like closing comments of the day. So I participated in a panel discussion with Frank Lenodo, who's the editor of our theme study. Uh, at the National Council of Public History <coughs> meeting in uh, March, I think it was. And I, uh, uh, we were talking about different preservation directions that, that could be taken. And so in pre preparing for that, I did a bit of a survey among state historic preservation offices, um, national register coordinators, to find out what their recent activity had been with AAPI if they were contemplating or working on theme studies, nominations, this sort of thing, or if they could tell me what was going on in their local communities. And the response was so low, I was really disappointed. So I sent it out again. I got a few more. But uh, then, and so I wanted comments, even tell me if you're not doing anything and why. And the response was, well, we don't really have, we never had Asians in, historically in our state. Well, I knew that wasn't true from that theme study. So 
I just want to say that I think that there's a lot of work to be done in every single state because some of this history is old, some of it's maybe archaeological, but it's there in probably every single state. So um, uh, what we're thinking of ways, and maybe we can even partner in this somehow, of really working with state preservation offices and local governments to, um, to energize people about their the spectrum of people who contributed to their history. So I just, I just wanted, wanted to say that, that we've got work to, got to do, even in state and national, in state preservation offices, starting there and then going down to local preservation offices. Stuff is starting to happen, but there's more to do. I want to also mention that um, there was an, an, an idea of like having a symposium in Truckee or in the area. Uh, our organization, API HIP, we had one of our national convenings back in 2016 in Stockton, California, which is 45 minutes south of Sacramento. And I know when we were doing outreach and inviting some folks from across the country to come to Stockton, and everyone was like, why would we want to go there? Right? And even on the other, the, the flip of the coin of that was people of Stockton were like, why are you coming here? Right? Even those who are third generation, Filipino American, Sikh American, Chinese American, Japanese American, like, why are you coming here? There's nothing here. They didn't see the value of their place in their own town. When we had our convening, we highlighted places like Chinatown, Little Manila, and the uh, first Ameri uh, Sikh American Gurdwara in North America in Stockton. People who were local and across the country were like, we didn't know these things existed in a town like this. By the end of it, people were like, we love Stockton. And Stockton was like, we love Stockton, right? Um, there's a lot of change happening. And those, you know, the sick who are there, uh, you know, didn't know what an NHL was, the National Register was. They also had a lot of fears of like, you're gonna, the federal government's gonna own our land and tell us what to do and what we can't do, right? But it's really talking through, we have folks from the Park Service, our state agencies, you know, across the country, we're just like saying, let's demystify the process and explore opportunities, right? Not to say NHL is the way we're gonna go right away and we're gonna get it done. There's folks from Little Tokyo and Los Angeles who came in and said, it took us 14 years to get our designation as an NHL. Not to say it's a bad thing, but it's a process in terms of funding, in terms of just getting it through, right? And so I think like having a symposium in Truckee or something like that is like an idea bring people from across the country and also invite local residents for that buy-in. Because we also invited, uh, who is now the mayor of Stockton, uh, Michael Tubbs, who's making his own headlines today. Um, but he was like, oh, star conservation matters. And he didn't know anything about it. And so really not shining the light for national government, but also shining the light for local residents, if you want to build that rapport so that you're not getting these, like, trying to minimize the backlash. Right? And for them to say, this is how we can partner and to build these long-term relationships so you're not just having a one-off symposium just to kind of like the Olympics, but how do you do it so that it starts off these long-term relationship building so that you can get to at different marker points, different designations, or different opportunities. So uh, if you follow if you follow 1882 and some of the things we did, this is not actually our first convening and talking about heritage tours, and it's not our first trip into the local areas to look at things. Everything from our touch, first touch base with uh, we look, or to talk with uh, the Southern the Los Angeles the Southern California Historical Society, or uh, or to the San Francisco uh, Historical Society. Now, all these things have all led or tied up to this. And actually, at the time that John and I were talking about this, we actually started talking several years ago with Dale, how do you actually duplicate these type of tours? And one of the key recognitions, and one of the things that prevented us from doing the heritage tour as soon as we did, or as late as we did, was because we were trying to find that local contact person and that networking with that person. And we know very clearly that the next step for us, in terms of physical things, is to figure out a way to get back to California. In fact, we're thinking about it in June, June and yeah. I don't think it's going to be in Truckee. I think it's going to be down in places like, although we're open for that. And so the idea is today's convening is to gather as many people more than we can to get that energy built up because of the Transcontinental Railroad to lay these little pieces on the table. 
And we're not quite sure, we got all the pieces, but the very best, get these pieces start analyzing and find the pieces that are missing, that are, should be here, that we know should be here, and get them to attend. And that includes uh, the local, local guys, the Union Pacific people, the Sugar Bowl people, the Chambers of Commerce, and so forth. We also want to combine with other objectives that we do, teacher workshops, outreach teaching programs, and things of this sort. We know that heritage tours can be done if it's sold as a pilgrimage. That's easy, actually, it's relatively easy to do. But the idea is how do you develop a heritage tour that attracts people because it's valuable in itself to all Americans and also you know, the tourist people who can make profit out of it. So the next heritage tour we're thinking about is going to be one that's developed for teachers. It's going to be, that's the target audience. The other thing is the realization that these uh, tours have to have more than just that one visit to that one place, that one experience. Very much the Montana roadshow model or these other things that we've talked about before. As I often said to John, we've talked about, you can do these heritage tours. It can't be too long, but whatever you do, like for example, in California, make sure that it ends up in Las Vegas. <laughs> so it's that thing, and one of the heritage tours we're thinking about is uh, mine, uh, uh, wineries and fishing camps. And what does that lead you to? It leads you to something that might start in the uh, Napa area, go to the Napa area, and look at the wineries. So the trick is, come to the history, learn about fishing camps and how the Chinese were involved in developing the mines. And oh, by the way, we're going to be stopping at all these wineries along the way, and maybe overnight at a, a place that you can buy stuff. So all those things are in the mix, and I hope that uh, we're going to see many of you guys, or some of you guys, over in, uh, in California. So the issue is either uh, one of the things to build this idea of going to Modesto or different places is I keep promoting we should go to Fresno, because there was a huge Chinatown there and a huge, very significant Asian population. It still is a very significant Asian population. In fact, it's one of the world's highest, uh, fastest growing centers for Hong, uh, Hong culture. And every year their, their event keeps growing larger and larger. But what happened to that Chinatown that literally had an underground Chinatown? And it's now underground. Huge Japanese population, Japanese American population, and so forth. But if you start there, you develop things as a teacher training program, and you take people up to the summit uh, tunnel or to different places, those are the things that we're looking for, the intersections. And so that's sort of the direction we want to go. So I do want to close this thing. Uh, please write your comments, give it to us. Uh, there will be a chance, I think, Ali, uh, you were taking names and putting them on this. So if people want to stay connected, I think Ali can explain how they're going to be doing that. And if you don't want to be connected, then let us know so we don't necessarily put your name on that list. Yeah, so as everyone's been saying, please just give it to, these are our uh, volunteers and workers for this uh, for the summer. We have Jaja and Bianca. Um, you can give any of us the cards with your feedback on it, your thoughts. Um, as Ted was mentioning, though, my plan is to have everyone who's RSVP'd, I'm going to follow up with a Google form that will have just some open-ended questions, but also just some general feedback about the event, and I'll also include some content fields like about next steps or ways you want to get involved. So we'll be visualizing that over the next, probably the next week or so, so just be on the lookout from that. Or you can just email me. I answer all the emails, so 1882 symposium, Gmail, or whatever you want to email, I'll find it. So. Any comments for tomorrow in terms of logistics, preparations, uh, getting into the building, has there been a problem or not? Give maybe a quick highlights of things you need to come back to to see because there's a whole host of activities that are happening tomorrow. Yeah, so for tomorrow morning, um, it's going to be a slightly later start than it was today. Although I guess we started a little late, so it'll be you know uh, not so far. Um, but yeah, the programming starts at 10 a.m. So as many of you did today, please arrive by like 9:30 or so because we will try to start as close to 10 a.m. as possible. Um, in the morning, we'll be um, building on. Uh, digital collaborations that we've uh, been working with uh, folks in New York with the Tenement Museum and um, thinking about the 
exhibit that we'll be partnering with MOCA on. We have heard here today from the Museum of Chinese in America in New York, um, thinking about the next steps and the power of digital partnerships and collaboration. That'll be in the morning at 10. We also have a panel after that about um, looking at a state-by-state -state and federal basis for affecting change in the standards of learning level. So we have our Director of Education, Ting Yi Yoi, as well as um, Greg Mark and Helen Ying, um, thinking about different states and different practices of getting Asian American studies and Chinese American histories into the K-12 uh, curriculum. We'll then have a, basically a full afternoon of a blend of public programs and discussions here in this room. So it'll be kind of toggling back and forth between this space, the SC Johnson Center, and Coulter Plaza, which is right outside that you passed coming in. There's a cooking demonstration with Martin Yen, um, and also at the presidential reception suite at 4.30, there's uh, a performance with the um, West Coast-based performance arts group called Ethnotech. Um, and they're performing their um, their demonstration at uh, 4.30 uh, called Red Altar. That'll be at 4.30. Um, and in the midst of all of that, we're having in this room the Creative Approaches to History and Storytelling uh, panel featuring Phil Chung, a uh, photographer working on a project, The Central Pacific, um, as well as Paisley Rectal, who is the Utah Poet Laureate, um, here performing as part of the Transcontinental 150, and a group of uh, designers from New York called Made with MSG. Um, so yeah, there's a lot happening, and I'm sure you all said stuff about getting to the Library of Congress. Did you already? Well, well, uh, you will. Did you, you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, well, I'm pretty much covering, but I just want to overemphasize that the museum is putting together those wonderful programs, the cooking up demonstration right here as you walk outside to the left at 1 p.m. We also have objects out of storage, which is a fantastic uh, opportunity to look at our collections. And here um, from our curators presenting it that uh, will be going on till 3 p.m. And then the performance uh, in, in the evening. I also received a couple of questions about visiting um, sort of related exhibition, if you will, about Japanese incarceration that's on the second floor. East Coast, um, Noriko Sanefuchi is the curator for that. Um, so maybe we can talk tomorrow about organizing a group. I know some people are interested and she can take one of the breaks and show you that exhibition as well. Um, we are tweeting throughout the day tomorrow uh, in conjunction with many other places around the country that are um, also commemorating this anniversary. And I think you have the, 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 the hashtag um, in your materials. And we also have a web page um, that feel free to look at it, and if you think of other places we should connect through it, please let us know. Also, on Saturday, for those who have separately registered, and I think there's still a little bit room for teachers, uh, it's a teacher workshop, and that will be a wonderful thing done in conjunction with uh, APA programs and uh, American history historians and uh, APA historians. So that's happening. Yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, one thing is that. Uh, that's also here. That's also here. Uh, so for those who are going over to the Library of Congress, that's at 3 or 5, it did say you're supposed to RSVP. Don't worry about that. Uh, just just sh show up. There's a, there's a little invite tape there from Judy Chu with little instructions that say if you want to take it. The best way, I think, is just go get the metro at the federal, cross the street, go to the federal metro, take either the yellow, orange, the orange, Silver or blue line going to Capital South. Capital South, and that's three stops down. When you get out to Capital South, there's only one exit out. <laughs> that will get you out to the Panama Building, and you'll be facing the Capitol Building. You just walk half a block, and the Library of Congress is on your right side corner on Constitution Avenue. Okay, which building? It's the, uh, uh, it's the Jeff it's the Library of Congress, it's Jefferson, is it called the Jefferson? It's the main building. It's the main building. It's the main building. It's the one on the independence. You want, uh, it, it's the only one that looks like the, <laughs> the Library of Congress has some really great buildings to the right side, they look like regular, regular office. But the one that really looks like the museum is right across the, so you, you, you get off the metro, you walk half a block, Independence Avenue, and the Capitol building's on your left side, and your other side is the, the, is the Library of Congress. Go through the ground level, 
you go through the main level also, which is the ground level uh, interest. It said it's for researchers and for uh, groups, but don't worry, just go in, do the security check, go to one floor, and the members' room is to the right side, uh, and it's to where the public counter lobby is and lobby counter and then you go inside there and there might be a sign that says uh, keep out unless you're a researcher but we'll probably have some people in the there. library of congress um asian american staff association is going to have several of their members there checking people in so you just tell them you're with judy chu's reception you're here from the 1882 foundation they're expecting you and basically i the list of people who are coming here today I gave to them. So they're like, if you're here, like, you're good. Just go up and explain what, why you're there, and they'll point you in the right direction. And if you get there early or you stay a little bit later, they have some wonderful exhibits. There's one uh, right now called Mapping the U.S., which is kind of interesting too. So, and they're all on that 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 level. Finally, any other sort of admin things? Um, any other thoughts? Anybody have comments? Finally, I wanted to point out to you that the postal, uh, U.S. Postal uh, Museum also has some wonderful things going on. And near and dear to me is, of course, Model Train Day. And so if you have little kids or other people, that's on Saturday. 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 Yeah. But even more near and dear is the, uh, they have some evening presentations, right? Uh, so there are these things out on the table. There are it's a set of three sort of envelopes that have some uh, Chinese uh, railroad sort of things connected with Chinese uh, workers. The reason for that is on May 10, tomorrow, the anniversary, 150th anniversary, the Postal Service is going to be issuing a commemorative stamp. So that's going to be the first day issue, and first day issue, and it's just a, it's the two engines of the golden spike. And your explanation so far it says that the majority of the construction was on the western side, was done by the Chinese. Uh, some people were disappointed that they didn't really have more of a representation of Chinese in these type of stamps. So what we did was <laughs> we created these envelopes, right? So if you tomorrow, even on the first day, you go buy a couple of these stamps and put them on here, and then stick it back into the post office box, post office, and get a date stamp, you're gonna have a first day issuing issuance stamp, right? If you can't, and that, since there's only, because only our budget couldn't afford to make a million of these things, there's only a couple hundred of them, so maybe 50 years later, 100 years later, you're gonna have this really neat, commemorative uh, first day issue stamp. If you cannot buy the stamp in time to get a mail in the post office, then there is an address. It's in this little sheet here. And what you do is you buy, you take your envelope, you put your stamps in it, and you mail it to this particular uh, post, post, um, post office. They, for the next uh, 120 days, if you get it within an end, they'll put a day stamp, which is um, uh, 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 May 10th. That's what they say. I don't know. <laughs> so you have what you do is you write it, you put your, your at home address, and then you send it to this particular post office in another envelope, right? And they'll open up the envelope. You can put up the 50 envelopes in, and they'll stamp, they stamp it and mail it back to wherever address you did. If you, if you put it to all your friends and people, that's great too. And if you do that, pick up one of our donation stamps <laughs> and stick it in the envelope and send it to them. And that would be wonderfully appreciated. So uh, there is a set of three here. There are going to be three forever stamps. Each one is worth uh, one regular stamp. But to, the three together, it makes it more fun or useful. But if you just want to use one stamp per envelope, which is all you need, then take a minute these guys and mail them. All right, so any other final thoughts? Thank you so much for being such a wonderful group of people. I hope that we have learned a few things today and that we continue this dialogue because we do want this particular place designated in some kind of summit designation 
that is uh, important for all of us, all of us as Chinese and all of us as Americans. Thank you.